Welcome to the Five Days Times, a podcast dedicated to the easy task of tackling the 21st century. It is a project born out of my conviction that doing so requires an interdisciplinary and intersectional approach to understanding our complex world. I'm your host, Jerry Ayub, and in these episodes, I bring you conversations at the intersection of politics, history, philosophy, culture, science, and all the fun stuff in between. The following episode was first published for monthly Patreon supporters. To become a monthly Patreon supporter, please head out to patreon.com slash times or check the website for other methods. You can become a supporter for as little as $1 a month. And if you cannot donate, you can still support this project by sharing with your friends and family and leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. The music of this podcast is by Tarabit. Here's the episode. So this is a conversation with Yefim Fergel and Julia Steinberger about a paper that they co-wrote entitled Socioeconomic Conditions for Satisfying Human Needs at Low Energy Use and International Analysis of Social Provisioning. I'm also going to read to you the very first paragraph of the abstract because I think it, it summarizes the paper uh, pretty well. Meeting human needs at sustainable levels of energy use is fundamental for avoiding cl- catastrophic climate change and securing the well-being of all people. In the current political economic regime, no country does so. Here we assess which socioeconomic conditions might enable societies to satisfy human needs at low energy use, reconcile human well-being with climate mitigation. I should say that the paper is available for free online. I will link it in the description of this episode as well as on the blog post as usual. So this is an episode that is largely based on hard science. And for that reason, I tried my best to not just be an engaging host, as I hope uh, I was, but also try and bring in those two experts to talk to a wider public. As usual, I uh, depend on your feedback to know whether I've done a decent enough job and whether you have some feedback as to how to improve and do better next time. So that's it for me, folks. Thank you for listening and take care. So my name is Yefim Vogel. I'm a PhD researcher in the field of ecological economics and sustainability at the University of Leeds. And I'm doing my PhD on the Living Well Within Limits project that is led by Julia, who's here with us today. So, um, yeah, and investigating the the grand challenge, I suppose, of, um, well, ensuring human well-being for everyone on the planet um, while also remaining within planetary limits and averting sort of environmental catastrophe. Um, So, and I'm Julia Steinberger, so my main claim to fame uh, at this point is being uh, Yefim uh, Fogel's PhD supervisor and very happy to collaborate with him. And uh, so indeed, I was uh, lucky enough to get this project on Living Well Within Limits, where we try to study lots of different aspects of this interdisciplinary question of how can humans live well within planetary boundaries and uh, using a lot less resources and studying inequality and all of that uh, stuff. And I'm really excited to talk about this uh, with Joey on this podcast. Well, thanks. I was, I was going to hope that you say that like your claim to fame is being on this podcast a second time, but that's fine. That's the main claim to fame <laughs> in my whole life. So we're going to primarily talk about a paper that you, that you co-wrote and there are others, please mention them as well, entitled Social Economic Conditions for Satisfying Human Needs at Low Energy Use an international analysis of social provisioning. So let's just start from the start. I have a bunch of questions. Some of them are coherent, some of them are semi-coherent, but let's just start with, if you can present the paper, like what is it about? What are some of its main arguments? So I would say the paper investigates the interlinkage um, of of the major um, environmental and social crises of our times. Um, And and we know that these um, environmental and social crises are interlinked but we need to better understand how they're interlinked. Um, and, and one of the main mechanisms that, that connect the environmental and the social crises is energy use. And, and that's sort of the, the baseline of the paper um, because energy use is, is linked to climate breakdown um, via emissions of CO2 and other greenhouse gases that occur in the use uh, of fossil fuels like oil and coal and gas. Um, and of course, it's also linked to another a bunch of other environmental issues via extraction and pollution and so forth. But on the social side, energy use um, is also linked to to social crises in the sense of of material poverty and material deprivation, in particular 
through our lens, um, the, the, the insufficient satisfaction of basic human needs, because um, what defines uh, the satisfaction of basic needs or the absence of poverty is that people are provided with the goods and services that, that meet their needs. So, for example, um, warm housing for the need for shelter, um, food and water for the need for nutrition, healthcare for, well, the need for health, safe sanitation for also health or hygiene, education for social participation and so forth. Uh, and providing all of these goods and services requires energy. Um, and, and, and basically the way that um, energy use links to both of these issues is through our economies or, or and economies, not just as the system of money flows, but as sort of the systems of provision of all God's goods and services, um, those that meet our needs and those that are sort of beyond basic needs or, or indeed sort of irrelevant to basic needs, um, through all processes um, in, the, in the chain of provisioning from the extraction of resources to production, transport, retail and consumption. Um, and that involves then physical systems and physical infrastructures like, you know, factories and mines and, and, and whatnot, and, and social systems uh, like markets and governments and, and laws and uh, competition and, and, and what have you. If, if we look at these two dimensions that we're trying to reconcile, these two major issues that we're trying to reconcile, the issue of, of, of basic need satisfaction or, very simply speaking, material poverty, on the one hand, and, and the environmental issues on the other hand, um, the problem is that that the one needs uh, so that the and for that for tackling um, environmental crises and in particular um, climate breakdown, we need to limit and indeed globally reduce energy use. So we can't use more than a given amount of energy use per person. Um, let's say something on the order of thirty gigajoules per capita. But then on the side of, of meeting basic needs, we require a certain amount of energy use per person to provide the goods and services that meet those needs. And, and that's currently, say, something around 60 gigajoules per capita. So we, you know, for, for social, for human well-being, basically, we need something like at least 60 gigajoules per capita per, uh, um, per currently. While sort of to stay within planetary boundaries, we need to get below something like 30 gigajoules per capita or something like that. So that's a real dilemma, right? Um, and and on the environmental side, we can't do so much about that because already this 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 number and that's sort of a rough estimate um, around 30 gigajoules per capita already assumes um, very deep and rapid transformations of the energy systems, rapid um, phase out of, of fossil fuels and rapid rollout of renewable energy use. So that is already sort of a, a quite optimistic um, estimate in, in, in a sense. But what we can do something about um, and, and that's very much the idea of this paper is is how much energy use is required per person to meet basic needs. Um, and, and, and in particular, then how could we meet everyone's basic needs at low levels of energy use? Um, and that varies with the characteristics of our economies or of our systems of provision that connect energy use on the sort of input side to, to the satisfaction of needs on the outside output side or on this, on the outcome side. Um, so the idea is, is to understand, um, what are the characteristics of of the, these provisioning systems? So basically, our our economy and our and the social systems that that surround surround it. Um, so basically, socioeconomic factors are what we call provisioning factors that influence um, at what levels of energy use different countries. We look at this at a country level internationally across one hundred and six countries. Uh, at what levels of energy use different countries achieve what? levels of need satisfaction um, and are there any countries that um, that sufficiently meet all needs within low enough levels of energy use that they could be sustainable and the answer to that is currently no not at all um, far from that and then and so what we what we try to assess um, quantitatively statistically um, is how the different differences in sort of in the performance in the relationship between uh, need satisfaction as as the outcome of provisioning and energy use as the input to provisioning um, are so how, how different factors affect that so how that varies with different characteristics and and so the idea is are there some um, characteristics or some sort of like setups of the system 
that allows societies to get higher levels of need satisfaction at a given level of energy use, or the other way around, and that's sort of more directly relevant to the question, are there certain characteristics that would allow countries to meet everyone's needs sufficiently at low levels of energy use? Um, that's the basic idea, and, and, and what we find is that indeed there are a, a number of characteristics that are quite relevant, that, that have... Um, um, that show a, a large influence in this relationship. Um, and th they really t relate to things such as um, public service quality, um, income inequality, uh, economic growth, extractivism, um, infrastructure, and so forth. Um, but they don't all interact in the same way. There's sort of um, positive factors or beneficial factors, if you will, that make it more likely to reach needs satisfaction at lower levels of energy use. And then there are uh, negative factors, detrimental factors that that um, make it less likely to reach high needs satisfaction at low levels of energy use. So and on the positive side, um, we find that higher levels of public service quality, higher levels of equality of income, or more, more, more equal uh, income distributions, more fa fairer income distributions, if you will, um, and more um, stronger democracy, um, as well as as universal access to electricity and and um, uh, and to clean cooking fuels um, are all beneficial to high need satisfactions at low levels of energy use. And on the negative side, in terms of detrimental factors, um, extractivism. So so the presence, the prevalence of of extractive industries. So so coal, gas, uh, fossil f well for coal, gas, oil, minerals, and so forth. Um, the more these are present in the economy, the, the less likely it is to achieve high well-being at low energy use. Um, and also, uh, levels of economic growth or, or economic growth rates um, are negatively associated at high levels of at high levels of affluence or moderate to high levels of affluence, um, and negatively associated with with uh, human need satisfaction. So, uh, at higher levels of economic growth. Um, Need satisfaction outcomes are are are, are lower than average um, at a given level of energy use. And well, you asked about the background, but maybe that's that's where Julia could um, could provide a better overview. So <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks, Yifim. Julia, go ahead if you want. Well, I think I think Yifim said uh, said quite a bit about in terms of the background being the these big challenges we face. I think that the the the, the thing that I was really excited about in this paper is that very often. Um, when people think about how we connect, um, you know, our consumption to well-being on the one side and unsustainability on the other, the thing that they put in the middle is human behavior and human preferences. And this study says, eh, let's forget about that. That's, that's not going to, that's not, that's, that's not the way that interaction works. And it really puts what, what's in the middle at a social level. So it's at a level of the most important priorities of our societies and, um, and how those priorities, how our societies prioritize different social goals actually influences the overall sustainability potential of those societies of providing good things for their people at low energy levels. So that's one thing I really like about it is because a lot of times people can't make that jump from it's about consumption but it's not just an individual question. So I think that was one great thing about the study that it really sort of broke, broke that, that, that boundary. Um, some boundaries are good to break. And the, the other boundary, it, um, it, I think, and the other thing I thought that it was really, really good at doing is it does it empirically. I mean, you know, the, we don't go into this with any like preconceptions or whatever, you know, um, I, I hate to say this, if human is going to, is going to come through this, the screen and throttle me here, but, uh, you know, it's it's you throw a bunch of data into the hopper, right? Like you're just throwing data into this machine and you crank it. I mean, it's a beautiful machine. Yefim built it and it's like really cool. And he's doing all these cool stats and it's all very, very sophisticated. And, but you just, you're just cranking and out the other end come these really stunning results that say, some things are gonna help you. Some things are gonna hurt you. Here's the domain of validity of that. And I think that that's really, um, really impressive as well that you can just, you can literally test for these things. That's pretty cool. And I, so kind of general comments. So I guess on, on the one hand, it's also emphasizing that 
without necessarily negating individual changes that this is not the most efficient way to get to this balance that we're that we're seeking um and i guess balance is is the is the word that comes to mind a lot how to reach this equilibrium i think you like the argument that you make and please correct me at any point because this is the best of my understanding is that like certain factors are associated with higher need satisfaction or, and actually require lower energy, uh, that they have a lower energy requirement, whereas certain other factors are the opposite. They have a lower need satisfaction and they actually have a greater energy requirement. So essentially, if like we were to extrapolate or kind of to get the ideal conclusion is to how to meet those needs at the required, the lowest required energy uh, use, if that makes sense, if I'm trying to be coherent on this. So um, at the same time, the dilemma, like Ifimi mentioned it and Julia, also you hinted at this, there is a disparity between the energy consumption in certain, most countries in the global north and obviously in energy consumption in the global south. And here I'm kind of using those two terms. Um, yeah, I mean, to simplify things a bit. How does one tackle the dilemma? How does the paper, or oh, what are certain arguments that the papers make, papers, sorry, what are certain conclusions that the paper makes that can help uh, tackle this dilemma, and better yet, maybe this is a follow-up, uh, depending how you want to answer. What do we usually misunderstand when we frame the problem like this? If that makes sense. Yeah. So maybe just a quick clarification um, first, because you said uh, like some factors have lower energy requirements and some factors have higher energy requirements. It's not so much the energy requirements of these socioeconomic factors as such, um, but rather that need satisfaction certain levels of need satisfaction mm -hmm. um have energy requirements um through what i explained through the provisioning of goods and services but these right, right. and it, but but what changes is 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 the level of energy requirement that is associated with a certain uh level of need satisfaction mm -hmm. and this changes with sort of the with a a, a condition or with a kind of um with a context um the socioeconomic context and that's that's what these socioeconomic factors or provisioning factors that we assess are about they um they sort of regulate or or moderate the relationship between between outcomes and 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 inputs if mm -hmm. that makes sense yeah um, so they make it they make it easier um to achieve good outcomes at with low inputs um or, or harder that's the if they're the detrimental ones um so yeah to to um get to your question about um development pathways and and global north global south so yeah that, that, that's exactly correct that the 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 dilemma really is that we we have sort of two well two pr prominent clusters of countries if we look at the international spectrum um there's the countries that sufficiently meet basic needs for, for most of the population. And all of these countries are highly unsustainable in terms of their level of, of energy use. So that's, that's problematic in the, in the environment, environmental dimension. And then we have a group of countries that where, where the level of energy use per person is within the levels that could be globally sustainable in the sense of compatible with with limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees um, but all of these countries uh, see large parts of the populations heavily deprived of of basic needs so they're they're deficient on the on the social side and and deficient of course we should say in light of of large global injustices and stuff now this is not just sort of under development this is a, we, you know we'll this is happening in the context of uh, of global appropriation and so forth. So that's that's maybe another topic that we could um, touch upon at some point. And of course, then there's there's other countries where <laughs> that are both unsustainable uh, ecologically speaking, so in terms of their levels of energy use and uh, deficient in their in their social outcomes and their need satisfaction. Um, for example, because of high levels of extra high levels of extractivism or or um, or corruption, these are, for example, some of the OPEC countries. Um, okay, but anyway, like um, st still with these two main clusters, uh, where of countries where so that are the, the, the types of countries that are uh, environmentally unsustainable but socially uh, meeting needs sufficiently, um, and on the other hand, the countries that um, are environmentally 
currently sustainable but but are are heavily deprived of needs they have sort of different they, they sit on for the for they, they face different challenges if we are going to meet everyone's needs globally um within within planetary limits and that's very much sort of the normative or, or the aspiration that the paper tries to inform let's say um then that means that countries where where needs are currently met but at highly unsustainable levels of energy use they would need to 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 figure out ways um to maintain roughly uh their their levels of need satisfactions while dramatically reducing their energy use in some countries uh by more than half in some countries even by a factor of four or something like that or or even more like with the very very wasteful countries so to speak um and um and for the countries, uh, so and, and so this group of countries sort of roughly maps onto the global north, so to speak, yeah. And then the the, the rough category of the global south, which is um, relatively low and and hence relatively sustainable levels of energy use, um, but but high levels of deprivation of of basic needs, high levels of material poverty, so to speak. Um, for them, the challenge would be to uh, to meet their basic needs for, for, for all of the population. And that, that's got to be a priority, I would argue, also in the context of climate change and, and climate justice. Um, but in order for us to have a chance to stay within 1.5 degrees globally or anything close to that, um, they would, or, or the world as a whole, you know, that, that, that probably could require financial or technological support from the global north, would, would, would have to find ways of doing that um, without following the same high energy development pathways that the global north has followed over the last century or so. So they have, um, they would have to um, find ways of, of developing with, with high development outcomes on the social side, but with, with, a, with a much, with a very different development pathway um, than what the, the global north has sort of, um, has done. Um, and is still doing, of course. Um, and, and so another way to look at, at the, 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 the kind of these socioeconomic factors is, um, is to identify factors that would allow for different development pathways, um, more sustainable, low energy development pathways. I wanted to ask if that's okay to, if you can give us just some examples of which country, like, because I think you, you mentioned that only 29 countries meet the basics of what we can call need satisfaction, but do so very unsustainably, as you mentioned. And in total, you have 106 countries, which uh, account for 90% of the world's population, 89% of global total final energy use, and 92% of global GDP. So pretty good representative sample. But what are these 29 countries? You, you said that, they are, I think, all in the global north or mostly in the global north. Um, and then it's sort of the reason why I'm asking is because I, as it happened, I just watched a very short doc on by by Vox, talking about the end of oil, and one thing that they they interview a bunch of activists in Nigeria, who talk about the hypocrisy of uh, this concept of leapfrogging, which uh, I if I understand correctly is like re developing but without but developing differently than how the global north did it, and. The reason why they mentioned the hypocrisy is obviously that they would have to do so with using the same pollut polluting mechanisms. And unfortunately, as we know, which is based on empirical data, it's just not sustainable at a global scale. At the, and so what they argue, the argument that's made by the activists is a climate justice argument, environmental justice argument that the global north needs to actually facilitate and help in that transition. Uh, so just to kind of have a more concrete picture for those four listeners who like me think very visually, like what are some of the countries that what are these countries? <laughs> what are the 29 countries? The 29 countries where, where needs are currently met. Mm -hmm. um, most of them are affluent countries, um, countries of the global north of, of the, the OECD, let's say, um, which of course have high, very high levels of consumption. Um, so it's not that high levels of consumption uh, don't also meet basic needs they, they they tend to but along with that comes uh, a lot of other types of consumption um that aren't maybe as necessary that are often you know luxuries um yeah. or very wasteful types of consumption um luxuries of course that's that's very heavily linked and that's also something that we empirically um find or that our empirical finding support um is, is very much linked to inequalities right it's 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 
also within affluent countries, it's it's not that everyone uses um, crazy levels of energy or like you know everyone's consumption is associated with crazy levels of energy use it's it's that also within countries there are there are sort of like rich rich segments of the population that have um energy footprints and and, and carbon footprints that are multiple times okay. higher than that of the average con um, population but it's of course also um and this is kind of what what the living well within limits project as a whole is is, is digging into but also what this paper um digs into it it's very much related to the systems of provision or, or provisioning systems. Um, so, uh, you know, if, for example, and this is something that's very typical in, 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 in Europe and in North America, um, all, all tra most transport is revolves around private car use. Um, and I know that you've uh, previously interviewed Julio and Julia um, about car dependency. Um, then, you know, then, then needs or access to need satisfiers um, are highly dependent on a high energy use uh, way of meeting those needs, right? Um, or if people live in, in, in large and, as in the UK, for example, very badly insulated houses, then just to have warm shelter, you need much more energy use uh, than if you had smaller and, and better insulated houses, for example. I think maybe to sort of, to, maybe to bring it back to more generalities, I think for me, it, it one of the outcomes, one of the insights of this paper is that it really comes down to, to priorities, to what a society prioritizes. And the leapfrogging idea is that, um, to, I mean, to some extent, there's some validity to it, which is that in a country where you have not yet built hard infrastructure that um, sort of condemns you to a very high energy intensive or very high carbon intensive way of running your, th your, your, your activities, why would you not, if you have the choice, why would you not build out the necessary infrastructure in a way that does not commit you to high, uh, to high emissions or high resource intensity? So in that sense, there's sort of this idea of like, okay, do, you know, if you have a choice, do it better, right? But at the same time, it's very disingenuous because um, developing the, 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 the industrialized countries, the mature industrialized countries are not, um, they're not doing the leapfrog that they need to do, which is to transform their infrastructure, which is a challenge that everybody who has any infrastructure needs to do anyway. Now, I think that the work of Narasimha Rao of Yale here is very interesting because he actually does the calculations of like, what is the physical infrastructure necessary to provide decent living conditions to everybody? How much energy is it gonna take? Like the build out of it, like the deployment of it. So he's really interested in modeling like, Everybody needs a hard uh, a hard building. Like you've got all you know, millions of people living in in shanty towns and um, with with unsafe roads. You know, if you, if your road isn't safe, you do not have a safe way of getting to work. You do not have a safe way of getting to hospital, etc. So you need. There are some things that everybody needs in order just to be to have a safe living environment, as part of their decent decent living standards, and that requires a build out of infrastructure. So. That infrastructure needs building. The question is, then what options do you have? So I, I like that that perspective better. So building out decent living infrastructure, I think, is a, a better way than just saying, "Oh, just go leapfrog." You know, it's like, <laughs> so that's one thing. And I think the, the 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 other way I would say it is that it's about priorities. It's about national priorities, and that's one of the things that we see in the in the Afim's paper is that if you have a um, for whatever resources you have, if you are prioritizing health. If you are prioritizing equity, if you are prioritizing um, the, the 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 facilitating factors that th these these enabling factors, if that, those are the things that your society is prioritizing, it will in fact also have an easier time providing decent living conditions at lower energy use. And so it's about having that coherence of what we are, are we trying to protect here. We're trying to protect human lives. We're trying to make sure that that there's no poverty, and we're trying to make sure that there's um, that there's no overconsumption necessarily either. We're not trying to pursue economic growth for its own sake because economic growth is actually detrimental, and most of it ends up uh, in the pockets of the wealthiest, exacerbating inequality. You know, so so it's about it's about the um, the sort of ethos of a society, and if that if that ethos is is turned turned towards um, these factors, the, the, in, in theory, at least according to what we can observe, uh, they should be able to have a much a much better time of it. 
But you mentioned economic growth, and I guess this is a good transition to the, the, the next question I wanted to ask is that you do mention stuff like the sustainable development goals, the, the Green New Deals, the whole Build Back Better, which we're hearing now in the context of the states and stuff. What are, what are so if they were to, in an ideal situations where the policymakers are reading this specific paper, what are certain things that they would be taking into account that they're not taking into account right now, if that makes sense? And if that's too broad, let me know. Uh, okay, I, I just want to maybe start on this issue because it's a very um, a, a debate that's often led very emotionally and very sort of like attached with a lot of attachment to mm -hmm. um, the current sort of paradigm. So, and 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 then the, this debate often turns very toxic. Um, so I want to just clarify uh, to prevent the, these attacks that come again and again. Um, what, what we are talking about when we are um, being critical of, of economic growth um, is, is two things. A, one is um, that we're talking primarily about economic growth in the global north um, in countries that are already affluent um, and where most people's needs are already met and also where economic growth has been shown not to benefit most of the population anymore but is, is absolutely captured within the top one percent or the top one of the top one percent um whereas whereas uh most of the population sees stagnating wages or even declining wages declining um living conditions and in fact through the same processes um of growth which which is related to to profits and 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 to kind of um privatization and so forth um but that that picture looks a bit different in the global south where um where it's it's absolutely important and, and everyone in this field acknowledges that that um um you know that um everyone um and in and, and particular, those that don't currently have their basic need met, needs met has a right, basically, to, to, have, to see those needs met. Um, and, and in some countries where currently energy use is very low, resource use is very low, that means that uh, levels of energy use and resource use need to increase somewhat. Um, and also, so long as we live in an economy that is highly commodified that is highly highly monetized where everything revolves around money and where where people have to buy most of the things they they need to uh to meet their needs um that means also that that most people need higher incomes very much dependent on how the society is organized very much dependent on as, as julia said on like to what extent public service are 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 free or not um so so that you know that requires probably some level of um income growth um, in in currently in, in countries of the global south, very simply speaking, um, but what what it, what hasn't necessarily uh, what isn't necessarily like a development map model that delivers good outcomes for these people um, is a model of of sort of trickle down capitalist growth, where you know where like where you just kind of pursue economic growth as a sort of as a supposed um, solution to all problems where you just care about the economy growing and then assume or or, or claim that that would um, trickle down to everyone and will pull people out of poverty it has pulled some people out of poverty but most of it has landed in the pockets uh, of the few and also most of the growth in the south has landed again in the pockets of the of the few in the north right has been appropriated by the global north so i think um we need to really distinguish, uh, or, or we shouldn't, I mean, the term economic growth is already so, um, you know, so heavily charged with all sorts of ideologies that it's really, really hard to kind of have a meaningful discussion on the basis of this term. Um, but what we really need to see is a prioritization of, of human well-being, of basic needs and so forth. And, and, and then I think, um, there are policies, and that gets me now to your question, there are policies, there are certain sort of ways of organizing the economy that is much more aligned with that. Um, and, and economic growth, I would argue, is at best very inefficient at that because most of it doesn't, it doesn't trickle down. And some of it, through some mechanisms, actually squeezes money out of the pockets of people and, and, and makes it harder for people to meet their needs. Um, 
and at worst, indeed, as in the global north, um, uh, is associated with de de um, de uh, deteriorating livelihoods and de deteriorating quality of life, and even de deteriorating uh, subjective life satisfaction. We've seen in in lots of uh, in most affluent countries, actually, um, while the economies have grown over the last uh, decades, life satisfaction has gone down, and I think that tells us something very profound um, about also the the social limits to growth. So to to um, get to your question, I, th I think um, how this can inform uh, things like the Sustainable Development Goals and Green New Deals and Build Back Better, um, well, is on the one hand a different or I would argue like the, the, the sort of the framing of the paper, the aspiration of the paper is very much aligned with the sustainable development goals. Most of most of the dimensions of need satisfaction um, that we analyze are reflected in the sustainable development goals. Also in Kate Rayworth's uh, donut um, approach of the safe and safe and just living space. Um, and and of course, also the, 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 the aspiration for environmental um, safety or, you know, environmental protection is, is of course, in the sustainable development goals and central to the Green New Deals and building back better, better and so forth. Um, what, what, is, what this paper hopefully can inform is, is our ways of going about that. And our ways of going about that can't be to just pour, sort of to, to just uh, boost the economic growth engine um, and somehow hope, and that's the, the. I would argue that's really the main narrative is that that somehow secures jobs. If we're lucky, that somehow raises wages a little bit, and and then somehow at the end of the day, people are a little bit better off or just as well off as as now. And that's a very, you know, that's that's very little to do with how the system actually works, and that's sort of just a very narrow view on sort of maybe one out of uh, 10 different places where we can intervene in the economy and, and a very indirect one and one that is also as we know uh, um, associated with environmental destruction and that's that's you know that's a real issue in the sort of in the context of this paper and why why this paper sort of takes the approach of 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 saying we need less energy use to start from because um, it's been shown um, and it's a very sort of I would argue sol solid finding in the empirical literature that economic growth um, can only to a very limited extent be decoupled from environmental um, damage from 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 emissions and so forth. Um, so that really what we need is um, a much more direct prioritization of social outcomes um, in a way that allows uh, less resources energy use. And, and that's where the policies come in um, that link onto our analysis. And, and, and there are, so one of the, I would argue most most promising findings that is, is is really very tightly reflected by analysis is the idea of um, universal basic services, um, basically providing free, high quality um, public services to the entire population. I mean, it's it's you know that's not rocket science that that's going to improve everyone's or secure everyone's basic needs. That's very obvious, you know. Uh, reducing inequality through something like, on the one hand, minimum wages or minimum income levels, uh, or something like a universal basic income potentially, with some conditions attached, um, and also limiting, you know, uh, higher taxes on on high incomes and, and taxes on wealth and so forth. Um, again, that's not rocket science. That that's going to mean that more of the consumption that happens in in a country get, goes to the to the poorer half of the population, and not not so much of of that whole uh, energy use and resource use and consumption um, goes into luxury consumption and, and the consumption of the top 10% and the top 1% and so forth. Um, so it's, I would argue it's, it's some of those policies also around democracy, the idea of citizens assemblies, which have, which have become really, which has gained a lot of traction um, in the UK in France in Germany, uh, probably in lots of other countries. Um, where anyway there is a sense, I think that that what uh, what what is labeled democracy currently really isn't very democratic at all, um, and and that one way that is much better at representing um, the view the views, but also the concerns and the daily life experiences of of people of of a very uh, broad spectrum of the population from reflective of of different. Um, groups in the population of, of, in particular, also marginalized communities uh, and young people as well, that really brings these people together, exposes um, 
exposes them to sort of to scientific knowledge and and other types of expertise uh and then let, let, lets them get in dialogue to to determine what kinds of uh policies or what kind of appro approaches they would support and what what, what these these trials or these the, the process where these citizens assemblies for example have been have been tested find throughout the bench is that that people support much more radical policies than what you know what than what is reflected in sort of in the polls or in in, in obviously in elections or in, in sort of in in public uh uh discourse as it is reflected in the mainstream media um so that it also shows i would argue that there is much more support for um for different kinds of policies and different ways of, of organizing the economy and, and different priorities um, to begin with. Uh, I wanted to, to um, I, I had mentioned, um, I mentioned this in previous and in previous episode as well, like I had read the briefing by the environmental, um, sorry, the European Environment Agency, because I had published this briefing in, in the beginning of this year, I think on, it's called growth without economic growth. And now, I don't know, this might be a, a kind of a reflection I, I, or a repetition, I'm not sure, but um, of the question of what I think you already answered it, basically. They're like, what would, because the title is one thing and then the, the conclusions are essentially, well, we need the growth and post growth, essentially, but it's just the title has to still include growth in, in its title. And I, I was wondering how would one go about, and this is just, you know, personal opinions, you know, feel free to answer however you want. To tackle this belief that growth equals good that growth just has because just on an emotion level it's a term that we use for everything like you know emotional growth and personal growth and whatnot and it's it's obviously used in certain in, in the discourse by politicians and within electoral campaigns i mean you mentioned julie before i seen that he he's been ranting a lot on twitter for example on how the car the car related debates in germany have been going for example and there, there is a certain way in which these things are framed that then takes us very far away from what we need to be talking about. And so my next question was actually going to be on like the importance of, of so like the importance of like citizen assemblies and stuff like that. So I, yeah, I just wanted if you, I wanted to ask if you can talk more about that. Well, I, I think, I mean, I think you're raising all kinds of really important, really important points around, um, you know that basically the notion of growth and which is really about development which is really about um you know growth in qualitative things not quantitative things when you grow emotionally it doesn't mean that you have a new organ that sticks out from behind your head that is your emotion bubble or whatever you know so say so, say so, so it's really weaponizing a very sort of vague term um and saying that and really channeling all human aspiration through this very narrow metric and very narrow way of doing things which in fact benefits the most powerful uh, at the expense of everybody else and is also destroying the planet which is a very bad thing um and so i think that that's something that really needs to be sort of debated and discussed and understood and in that in that process i think the one of the things that, that's really a positive development is this idea of citizens assemblies as they were um, pioneered sort of in Ireland, uh, probably most prominently, but in other places as well. And I guess one of the things to say is citizen assemblies are just one example of a whole array of fantastic um, participatory, immersive, engaged citizen coming together and discussing how to do things differently and how to understand things differently. But the which all each of them could, you know, the, I think that that's one of the things that's really exciting about the time we live in is that, you know, we get we get to try these different things out and see what see what we can get from 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 them, um, and see how we can really use them to to move our moment forward. I think one of the things that's really great about citizen assemblies is if and when they are broadcast, because the I have been in those in some of the rooms where these assemblies were happening. I've been part of some of the processes. And I could see transformation happening right then and there. I could see not just like learning, but engagement, but people, people changing their minds, people transforming how they understood the world. Like you can, it's just a magic place to be. And it's a magic moment to be in and to be part of it. And I, my, my, under, you know, I was there as an expert, but my understanding was changing too, right? Because you're talking to real people and it's so important. And we forget that. And, uh, and the, and the thing is that the, not everybody gets to be part of that room. If everybody in the world, if we had a way of making everybody in the world be in a citizens assembly on climate, you know, we could do it today and we'd be done tomorrow, right? 
but we need to bring people into that room somehow. We need to be bring people into that process, which has to be done with a small group of people. Otherwise, you don't get the kind of communication and debate you need. Um, and so I think that media is really important. So one of the things that really made the Irish uh, Citizens Assembly on Abortion a success was that it was transmitted live on Facebook, I think. Um, and people just tuned in and rebroadcast stuff and like people cared about it. And it was really sort of its own broadcast mechanism. Now for other topics, we need other ways, but I think so media, media engagement and rebroadcasting of these things is essential. Um, so that so that basically people get to be part of the journey of understanding that this microcosm of society is going through. And that's really, really important because that changes everything. That changes absolutely everything. So I think that those kinds of processes are, are fantastic, are a fantastic way of, of moving us all forwards by leaps and bounds much faster than you can just by seeing one thing written here, one thing written there, one newspaper article there, one opinion column there. Um, I mean, indeed, this title, Growth Without Economic Growth, is, it's uh, it's ridiculous, isn't it? It's like it, it really shows an attachment as well as a, a well, like, yeah, it's, it's almost an oxymoron, isn't it? <laughs> um, but it, it relates, of course, to the idea that uh, or to an idea that people um, maybe in in the establishment and political and economic elites, but maybe also people, uh, you know, more in the, in the broader population aren't, aren't ready to give up on um, because, as, as Julio was, was, was touching upon, because they've been, you know, because these narratives around growth as progress, as, as the savior, you know, as, as the sort of like the silver bullet solution to all problems have been promoted so broadly and have been, you know, have pushed out like propaganda uh, for decades and decades. And I think that has, you know, that has been established that way. And that's something that I'm looking at in, in my current research, because growth is, of course, the way out for profit, right? Growth is, of course, what 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 underpins profit and what, what, what enables profit to happen um, without negotiating with people's livelihoods in the sense. So like growth is, of course, a way out of distributional conflict, right? If you don't have growth, then of course, um, there's this much harder competition about the existing pie, so to speak. And so growth has been sort of uh, promoted and, and pursued as, as the way out of um, negotiating between profits of the rich and the livelihoods of the many. But not only for uh, for the reasons that we've touched upon, you know, the environmental reasons, but also for a number of other reasons, growth anyway is coming to an end or the reliance on growth is coming to an end, you know, because we're also faced with secular stagnation. Uh, we're also faced with an increasing amount of crises, uh, environmental crises, of course, and keeps thinking about also public health crises, right? We're currently in a pandemic, of course, um, where that that derail the economy that that bring the, the the economy to a certain standstill and as and in and and in the current economy where everything relies on on the economy um you know to to continue and to grow um and as soon as it doesn't we're where th things collapse basically and we're we're in crisis and we're facing hardship um that's a very very vulnerable economy um and and in the 21st century we were faced with multiple crises uh as well as you know hard or 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 very very um you know unnegotiable environmental limits limits and resource limits as well um i think we really have to learn to design our economies without relying on growth it just makes me think of like one of the sentences i like from the degrowth movement is you know change by design instead of by disaster. So that kind of comes to mind pretty obviously, I think. Um, one thing that uh, before kind of getting into the book section, if that's okay, um, kind of a couple of questions that may be interlinked, I'm not sure. Uh, the first one is like, what do you see as the kind of the next step for this, this paper or this research or the conclusions that you've reached in this research? What are certain things that can follow from it? Like what, where should the research go or where mm -hmm. should societies go? Both. <laughs> <Which of the, laughs> you can start with the research, yeah. Well, in terms of the research, um, quite a few things, of course. Um, one is that we would need to look at this over time. Um, 
as one dimension and we would need to be able to look at a lot of things um, that we currently can't look at because they're not being measured and they're not being measured because they're not prioritized because our mad model links back to the model of development that cares about certain things right that cares about gdp that cares about maybe some aspects um of 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 material poverty but not others right so it's a it, it relates to societal um priorities but um a lot of the things that we would be really interested in in, in assessing here and in, in, in measuring or well in, in being able to analyze in this kind of analysis um we we can't because there is no data on that so that relates for example to international um you know, interrelations between countries in terms of what I, what I touched upon in terms of um, appropriation of resources and, and um, of, of value um, and in sort of more political economic aspects um, of, you know, of vested interests, transnational corporations, um, these sort of things, um, as well as looking at how things have changed over time. Um, but of course, this is also like, this is a very, you know, this is a very high level analysis, what we've done here. So of course, this would need to um, be broken down into um, more specific contexts. You know, you would need to look at this at at the national level and indeed at sub-national level, which fortunately <laughs> um, other people in this research project are doing um, in, in, in sort of like in, in very, I would say, um, complementary ways, um, you know, looking at um, income inequalities within countries, looking at household level differences um, and looking indeed at specific systems of provision around, for example, um, transport, around um, electricity and energy systems um, and so forth. And also at, at processes that we just touched upon of, of you know, democratic um, deliberation and so forth. Um, but I think, uh, and this is also something that we touched upon, but that also like in this project, but that requires, um, you know, a, a broader effort um, is, is what <laughs> at some point in a draft that I think, I think that what didn't quite make the cut, but is, is sort of like what I call the, the, the ultimate provisioning factor. Um, which is the political economic system, which constrains all of this, right? So, like, all the the the, the reason why um, provisioning systems are currently designed in a current in, in a particular way uh, links to the the grand political economic system that is dominant in the world. And because we've recently had this paper published, uh, like some colleagues of ours uh, in Leeds had this paper uh, published that said, um, permission to say capitalism, I'm now allowed to call it capitalism, <laughs> uh, paper by Stephen Hall and Mark Davis, um, that, you know, that very much um, shapes how things are happening currently and, and what's possible currently. Um, and, and and that reinforces itself through the through the power structures that are entailed in it, right? Where where vested interests have a huge influence um, on politics, on public opinion, on the media, and so forth, and so make it very very difficult um, to for for change to happen. So so I would say like the broader thing that needs to happen um, academic or in terms of research is to to better understand um, the you know, the fundamental, well, I think that actually the fundamental issues with that system are very well understood. They haven't, you know, they're, they're, they're not yet established in, in broader public discourse, although they are definitely getting there. And indeed, you know, you mentioned degrowth, um, which has really gained traction over the last few years. And I don't think it's a coincidence that this is happening in a context where the world as we know it is, is you know, is crumbling to pieces. Like that's when people are looking for alternatives and there are alternatives out there now different from in 20, in the 2008 and 2009 crisis, you know, where that, that, where that kind of um, hasn't been, hasn't translated into transformative change. And, you know, whether the COVID crisis does so is, is yet to be seen, I would say, but what was definitely changing, I would argue, is the discourse and the, the, um, the awareness that there's something much deeper going on. Um, and that needs addressing and you know like indeed people on this like on the streets and the environment and social movements they realize that including uh, including the youth strikers uh, the the school strikers and fighters for future and so forth that talk about things like planet over profit which really really drills like you know which which really hits the nail on the head because <laughs> that's exactly what it is about um so i think we you know we need more research along those lines um of like you know what, what could a different 
um, political economic system look like? What could a system look like that, as I said, you know, that secures livelihoods, that provides welfare without economic growth, and indeed in a in a, in a shrinking, selectively shrinking economy, um, probably. But then this is sort of this is the the what, if you will, or, or like I think of it as the what. What kinds of systems would enable living well within limits? W would enable human well-being for everyone? everyone <laughs> uh, within planetary limits. Um, but then the part that I think is, it, it receives even much less attention, but that is probably as crucial is how, how do we get there, right? And that's about uh, how change happens um, and, 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 and how it is being resisted, right? You pointed to that and we touched a, bit, a little bit upon that in terms, of, in terms of vested interests, in terms of propaganda and in terms of discourse, in terms of very, you know, the, 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 these are not passive mechanisms, right? We know of the, the story of the merchants of doubt and how the fossil fuel industries has for decades and continues to disinform, deflect, delay, uh, you know, um, another project that's that that uh, another paper that julio is involved uh, and maybe she can tell a bit more about it in a second is, is this uh, paper on the de discourses of climate delay uh led by will lamb it's also a co-supervisor on my phd um and uh and so so basically the kind of emancipatory changes towards um you know towards human well-being and environmental uh, protection are being very actively opposed by those that that benefit from the status quo financially or in terms of in terms of um, power and so one of the things that's really important to better understand is of course the role uh well the ways things can change in particular the role of social movements um in, terms, in particular you know ways of, of 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 rapid social change and and the different roles that different actors in society can play in that but then, of course, that's only the side of of knowledge. And then, really, what we need is is action. Um, you know what we need much more of. So uh, that's that's a whole different story. But uh, you know, but the main thing, of course, we need is because I, I would argue, by and large, we we know enough to go very well in the right direction. Right? We know very much what we can't have. We we know very well what we need to stop with immediately. We know very well. The, a few things that would immediately get us on the right track, right? In terms of like, so if we if we control, for example, luxury consumption that could almost overnight, as Kevin Anderson keeps arguing very rightly, so could almost overnight cut emissions globally by a third. <laughs> that's a, you know that's the kind of emergency intervention that would really make a difference. And then um, then we could sort of like start sailing in the right direction. Um, and we know you know a lot of the types of policies that could secure people's lives in the transition. Um, while sort of gaining some time to, um, you know, to to figure out some of the questions that aren't yet known. Maybe I'll leave it there. Did you want to add anything, Julia? Yeah. So in terms of next research, I mean, uh, Yehima outlined a lot of things. I think one of the things I'd like to do is have some more specifics. Um, I'm really excited about specifics of provisioning systems. So I think this provisioning system thing, this idea that we, we, you know, and maybe this ties in with some of your uh, your podcast interests around solar punks and so on, which is that. Everybody likes to discuss economic organization in generalities, but I think specifics matter a lot to people's daily life. And so I think we need to study like, hey, what would be good ideas for organizing provision of food differently, provisioning healthcare differently, housing, transport. Um, so all of these things could have different combinations of things like, because everybody's like, oh, you always need a worker cooperative or this. Well, for some cases you need a consumer cooperative or user cooperative or um, a community cooperative, like different forms of, um, of things we need probably benefit from different forms of more or less localized, more or less um, democratically managed um, provision. And so I think that that's actually super interesting to study. And there's some people doing it around food and farming and stuff like that, but I think we need to do it for all of these different things and sort of have a, you know, so you could almost choose off the menu, you know, like, how, what, what, what you want to do for your pushing systems? Well, I'd quite like the, this kind of community energy thing. It's like, we have, we can be creative about this and study a lot more and also understand the pros and cons and risks of these different ways of, of governing the things that matter to make our lives possible. So I think that that's one of the things that's really, really interesting. The other thing that I'd like to, to, to try to study and, and also study it in terms of like, you know, the physical underpinning of a decenting, a decent functioning healthcare system, like we've done in very broad brush strokes, 
in the past, but we can do it with a lot more specifics. So that's, that's one thing. Uh, the other thing I think is um, to try to understand some of how we, how we can connect degrowth and modern monetary theory a bit more. Um, because there, I think that there's this idea of, a, of a, what a sovereign economy means. And when I hear Stephanie Kelton speak about it, I'm trying to sort of follow what she's doing. Um, she talks about the real economy, which is the economy that we have the capacity to make, the thing that we have, the, where we have the capacity, the work capacity, um, the know-how, the resources to make things happen. And she basically says, you can't have the kinds of crises and inflation and so on if you're using the real economy. And so one of the things I would like to understand is how we can connect these ideas of universal basic services and sufficient provisioning for all with what is our real economy? What do we have the productive real capacity to do? And then think about the economic system that would be the, you know, if we need a monetary terms of exchange to do that, what that looks like. But I think that that's what's really important is that right now we have productive capacity that's like they're underused or misused. And it's about reorienting that. But how do, how do we how do we think about that? Those are sort of two directions. All right. Well, I mean, before getting into the book section, if that's OK, is there any any um, any topic you wanted me to get into? Any questions you were you wish I would have asked? Or did I do a decent ish job as a host? You're a fantastic host, as you know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I think, yeah, I was I was hoping, you know, it's kind of uh, I guess you, you got it right that this I was sort of I, I think this paper is like fantastic that you asked mm -hmm. us to talk about. I think it really brings the debate a whole bunch of steps forward. But um, I was also afraid that it would sort of die a death because there's too much maths in it and too much analysis and that people would be like, oh, just, just well, not you know, be able to deal. And know, like, so uh, I think it's really, yes. it's really great if we're, if we're able to just sort of discuss it at the level that people can sort of grapple with what it means. We're, you know, we're really talking about what parameters, socioeconomic parameters allow us to move our societies into a more sustainable direction, both environmentally and socially. And there's that we have some sort of big, big steering wheels where if we steer those in certain directions, they can really help us get there. I think that's the, the main idea. I, I definitely think this paper would be really good as like video infographics and video essays and stuff like that. I can really, I can, because I think very visually, so I can really picture like a Vox explainer type uh, or a series of them actually exploring different contexts. They can they do it well when when the, they do it well and sometimes they do it not as well. But that's a critique for another time. Um, are you feeling any anything else uh, on your side? Uh, I think if you know, I've, I would agree with Julia. You've been a great host, and uh, <laughs> I think we've covered a lot. Um, one thing I forgot to mention, maybe around the citizens' assembly thing, is um, that there are initiatives actually in, in the UK, and I was I was um, lucky enough to be. Um, involved in and in one that try to explicitly link this the thing i'm talking about is is the cee bill the climate and ecological emergency bill and, and and julia was also uh one of the expert contributors um that have been uh that have been asked to you know that have informed the the formulation of the bill um and and what this bill would do is to to tie some principles, some sort of targets um, on both the climate emergency and and the ecological emergency in terms of in terms of biodiversity loss and and ecosystems, which is as important and and maybe touched talked about a bit less, um, to a democratic body at the heart of it, um, a citizens assembly um, that would decide the strategies or that would sort of inform the strategies of how this is being met. So there are, you know, there are campaigns out there that, that already connect some of the dots. Um, and I think this one is, is a really, really promising one um, that could be a blueprint that could be followed by other countries as well. And that um, in particular in the run up to COP26 would really um, be a way for, for the UK that hosts COP26, of course, um, to show real leadership and a type of leadership that could you know spark a different kind of international climate regime that is much more based on climate justice that sort of that um links with the kind of i suppose analysis and worldview that also underpins the, the paper that we've been talking about today that you know that recognizes um different um responsibilities but also different um 
capacities of different countries and different different levels of um, you know emissions and so forth, um, and 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 grounds the response of countries in an equitable um, approach and one that that protects uh, marginalized communities and 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 workers in affected sectors um, domestically. So um, there as well, I think we are starting to um to see ways of integrating these things and some of the the, the green new deal um packages do that as well that they really tie in this idea of um of social justice and climate justice and tie, tie them together of like of protecting people's livelihoods of protecting people's uh, well-being um and through things um such as green jobs, but also through things such as universal basic services, universal basic income, and tying that to really radical, um, well, some more than others, but to radical, um, you know, environmental protections. And, and for example, there's been proposals for a, a Green New Deal without growth that would um, incorporate a lot of the ideas and policies that we've been talking about today and that also um, are very much in line with the analysis in our paper. Thanks a lot for that. Um, all right, well, I always end the episode by asking the guests if they can recommend three books. So what are three books that you would recommend and if you can say why as well? So I've got, I haven't quite made my mind. I will do that in this very second. It's always hot. Uh, but one book I definitely want to recommend is, I'll just hold it in the camera, although no one can see the camera, <laughs> is, um, is Less is More by Jason Hickel um, with <laughs> the subtitle How Degrowth Will Save the World. And so it is... Um, I would argue it is, to me, one of the most holistic um, overviews over the environmental and social problems of our times in a really sort of um, deep critical analysis of the systems that causes, of capitalism, of its history of capitalism as well, and its colonial roots, linking it to new colonial um, practices that sort of, you know, still continue uh to this day and that that are still very much um part and parcel of 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 the issue and of what's holding us back from from tackling it on either side um so both on the environmental and on the on the social justice side um and and i think it's kind of a, a combination of a really brilliant analysis of of where we're at and a really sort of hopeful but realistic picture um i would argue realistic in the sense of like if we manage to Mobilize, mobilize around these ideas, and 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 maybe I haven't stressed this enough, but like I think really these ideas around degrowth, um, even though they are often misportrayed, there really are a chance to reconcile environmental and social um, issues, also in a way that that speaks to that addresses the concerns of 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 people across the population, including very much workers. So it's something that should very much speak to workers, to trade unions and so forth. So that I see these kind of ideas that being, are being put forward there as, as a way to also unite or to kind of as a point of convergence for, for, for environmental movements, social movements and labor movements. And I think that's the kind of, you know, the kind of as well as, and this is very, really, really important in degrowth discourse today um, to link that to decolonial struggles, to feminist struggles, uh, to struggles of environmental injustice in terms of, you know, in terms of environmental conflict around the world, but in particular in the global south that are, of course, linked to our consumption and to our um, profit uh, making in the global north. Um, so these kind of ideas that are being pushed forward there, I think, are really a chance to kind of um, to see common causes across these struggles and, and a kind of analysis that that pulls these things together, I think. And, and, and that's also why I see degrowth as a sort of umbrella analysis in particular that really shows these connections and that shows, I would argue, a, a, not a perfect, but a sort of quite holistic um, approach for how to address this and, and quite a hopeful one, I think. That's also why degrowth is, you know, why sort of the, this idea of utopian thinking as a positive, not a sort of not an impossible, but also a positive thing, is is, is sort of um, quite prominently um, put forward in in, in degrowth discourse. Um, and the second book I want to recommend is um, sort of maybe a bit less positive in that sense, but it's really important because it really um, I think speaks to 
um, or touches upon many of the issue that really get in the way big time. It's um, a book by Noam Chomsky um, called The Ten Principles of Concentration of Wealth and Power. I mean, of course, there's, you know, Noam Chomsky has more books than, you know, <laughs> than anyone could ever read. Uh, and I'm sure there's lots of good ones. This is uh, one that I find is a sort of uh, a short and accessible summary of, of really key issues that um, that are central to all of these things in a very, you know, a very um, good and critical understanding of power, of, of, of vested interests, of propaganda, of the workings of the media, of, of the false notions of, uh, of democracy, like in the sense of, you know, of, of like, um, of the illusion of democracy that is, um, that is being created and of the lack of real democracy. Um, so I think, um, you know, in these, in our, in public debate and also academic debate, um, of the issues, but also of, of solutions or ways forward, we really, really need to, you know, look, look the devil deep down the throat and, and really understand kind of the, <laughs> maybe that's not the right thing, <laughs> um, but, um, really need to understand the, the mechanisms, um, that resist emancipatory changes and that sort of are very highly vested into the status quo and that will fight it, you know, whatever they have um, to to prevent some of these changes that we're talking about. So to me, that's kind of the two, two of the main sort of ideas um, that are critical for for social change at a at a political level. And it has to be like at a, at a collective level. Um, but the third book I want to um, recommend is kind of is more it's much more it's on the personal level um, but that I think is also something that is kind of uh, very relevant to at times so this is a book by uh, Brené Brown who's a, um, a social researcher um, it's called Daring Greatly and it's very much about um, notions of um, vulnerability and shame and and sort of like a more uh, wholehearted living um, that I found sort of like personally really um, valuable in um, in different ways of relating to each other. And and I think, you know, um, in the sort of bigger picture, the kinds of changes that we that we need are, you know, are are so all encompassing. But like one, one thing that absolutely has to change in the long run is 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 a change in our culture. Um, of of and that transcends of course all all areas including including personal interaction i think um yeah um i found her approaches really powerful for a way of interacting and 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 communicating that is um that gets to the bottom of of what connects us rather than what um keeps us apart i suppose so i'll leave it there um, so I get three books, so uh, the ones of you whom sound great and hopefully um, there's no double. So I want to recommend The Future Earth by Eric Holthaus because I've been reading that and enjoying it. And uh, it has a lot in it, lots of different ideas, lots of different testimonies of different people. So it's a radical vision of what's possible in the age of warming. And I think it's pretty great. Um, another one is, uh, it's older, so our, The Future Earth came out quite recently, but this one is a couple of years older, it's from 2014, is We Make Our Own History by Cox and Nielsen. And they're sort of uh, Marxist historians of social movements, and they have this idea of, um, I think they have ideas that can really help the sort of uh, contest contestation movements that we see today, because um, uh, that we're sort of stuck in this liberal paradigm of demanding things from power. And they have a very different idea of what power looks like and what social movements look like and how they can create disruption and change. And also they have this idea of social movements from above, because I think a lot of us are sort of from a social science perspective, we're stuck in this idea that structures of power, you know, we have these structures that are sort of imposing bad things on us, including growth. And they're like, listen, it's, it's, it's gangs and the gangs are associated together and there are people in them and you can understand that. And they, you know, they like us, like we can understand them, like we can understand our own work. 
They have campaigns too. They have things they're trying to get done too. They have weaknesses and disagreements too. And the more you understand them as sort of a, a bit more of a messy conglomerate of groups and individuals with very varying agendas, the more you're gonna be effective in actually trying to disrupt that, that structure. So I thought that, I think that that's quite, um, quite a helpful book. And the third one has just come out and I haven't read it, but I'm assuming it's going to be absolutely great. I can't wait. And it's called uh, Overheated by Kate Aronoff, How Capitalism Broke the Planet and How We Fight Back. And since Kate Aronoff is one of the smartest people out here and one of the best writers, and this is this exactly on these topics, I think that that is going to be a heck of a book. And so I really am looking forward to reading that one. So go get it, everybody. Amazing. Well, um, Yafine and Julia, thanks a lot for your time. Uh, I really enjoyed it. And I'm pretty sure listeners would agree. Thanks so much, Joey. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having us. My pleasure. Thanks, Joey. These times is made possible by supporters on Patreon. If you'd like to support through a monthly donation, you can head out to patreon.com/slash fire these times. If you want to explore other options, you can do so by checking out the website.